Hello, sorry for, for the delay. There seems to have been some kind of uh, technical issues. I'll, I'll try to make up for it. <coughs> so, data lakes for financial entities. And, and why data lakes? There are many kinds or many types of uh, big data architectures, uh, such as Lambda architectures or Kappa architectures, as you may know. <coughs> but it, even though they're used in banking, uh, I believe that for the uh, main informational repository or main informational system, uh, data leaks are probably the best kind of uh, architecture for, for a bank. And the reason behind it is that, well, for one instance, banks uh, have uh, heterogeneous information, which is uh, basically common in, in big data. And banks have a vast amount of information, both in terms of volume and attributes. Um, there's also a lot of uh, regulatory uh, requirements that are constantly and rapidly changing. But I think overall, the thing about financial institutions is that you don't need all of the data at once. Uh, you just need it sometimes. And the thing is that once you need some kind of data, you won't need it from that point forward, but you will need to load uh, as much historic information as you can. And, and that makes them uh, great for, uh, for data lake solutions. The thing is that probably data leaks are one of the most complex uh, architectures to implement in any kind of entity. And we did a, a research earlier this year in the United States um, where we met most, if not all, of the tier one institutions in the United States. So think about all of the big bank names that, that you can think of the United States. And out of 36 entities, uh, we found out that only seven uh, had implemented a data lake solution. And 18, or 16, sorry, uh, were in the, place, uh, were in the <coughs> process of implementing one. And what really shocked us is that when we tried to find a, a success case, we, we found zero. We, we didn't have in one case of a, of a data lake that they were happy about that was running in a, on a financial entity. It's extremely hard to, to implement a data lake. And we tried to, to narrow down the, the main issues for failing in, in implementing a data lake. And we found four main reasons. The first one being focusing on the irrigation processes and getting all of the data in the data lake. Uh, we will speak about this later. The second one is about trying to cure all of the data, to validate and cleanse all of the data, and moving them to, to the next layer. So basically, everything that's coming in is, is moved to the curated layer or the process layer. The third point being not paying enough attention to metadata. And metadata is critical in data lakes, and we will see this later again. And the last point is trying to approach it as a big man project, thinking, okay, this is the final picture I want, and how can I get to that big picture instead of trying to narrow down the, the steps of the, of the process. So let, let's go to, to the architectures. And well, one of the things about data lakes is that there is now a common architecture that you can say, okay, this is the common architecture for every data lake. It, it really changes from one to another. And I've tried to keep it simple and go out in more layers, as, as we will see. But, but I think we, we could all agree that the basic layers within the data lakes are the raw layer. Basically, the raw layer is where data arrives. And it's stored in a raw and treated format, just as it looks in, in the source systems. The second layer would be the process layer. And here, uh, it stores all the data that is actually used. Uh, we don't have all of the data from the raw layer, just the things that are being used or, move, or should be moved to, to the process layer. Uh, it may be cleansed data, maybe calculated data. Um, and this data is, as I was saying, ready to be used. Now, the third layer would be a reporting layer. And here, Basically, data is aggregated in order to be uh, consumed. And it is where it's consumed by the user. So I think more or less we could agree that those are the three main layers that would define a, a data lake in general. I know we could split it into more layers. For instance, we could split the raw layer into a landing layer, where actually the data arrives. It's not treated. And a staying, a staying layer, where you actually store the data. The landing layer would be more of a temporary stage. And we could split the process data into two parts. We're having the trusted data, which is data that you've cleansed from staging layer, and the business layer, that is data that you have calculated and is derived from uh, uh, trusted data. 
But since we are going to get into more complex layers, let's try to uh, just keep it simple. And, and please bear in mind that this is just uh, one point of view. There are a lot of ways to, to define a data lake. But in the end, more or less, there are three layers. A raw layer, a process layer, and a reporting layer. Now, going back to the reasons for failure, uh, I think that when we see a data lake, we want to get there as fast as possible. It's a great architecture. Uh, working with it is, is amazing, and we will see the best ways to, to take advantage of these kinds of solutions. But when we see this picture, we want to get to the picture as fast as possible. And <coughs> since data comes from the raw layers, moves to the process, and then goes to reporting, we usually try to approach it the same way. Say, okay, let's go to the raw layer and feed everything in it. And then move it to the process layer, and let's move everything. And then we'll do the reports, and maybe in two or three years we can use it. And that's not the point. I mean, you want to use it as fast as possible. One of the great things about implementing the data lake is the time to market that you have with these kinds of solutions. And the, the right way we believe to approach it is uh, not from a bottom-up approach, but a, from a top-down approach. And the way it's done is basically, OK, you do have a business need. You never have a data need. Data without use is, 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 not, is nothing. So you should focus on what are you going to do with the data lake. And take any project. Take any business area, take whatever you want, and start with the reporting. And analyze what the data will be used for. Analyze the business itself, the reporting layer. From that, move down and go to the process layer and say, OK, in order to generate these reports, whether they're for management or regulation or whatever, I will need this data. And I will define the set of data that I will need in the end in the process layer. Whether it's derived data from additional attributes that I may have, or it's data that exists in my current source systems. And once we've done that, we can move to the raw layer and take a look at which source systems have the information that I need. OK, here's the point. When I go to a source system, I will bring everything in. Not just the attributes that I need, but everything that I can get out of the system. The thing is that I will only move to the process layer what I'm going to use. And then I move to the reporting layer what is actually the, the reports and the needs for, for the business area. <clears throat> so we're going to be adding some additional layers uh, the first one, and, and for me the most important one besides these three layers, is the metadata. And for those of you that aren't as used to, uh, to metadata, as, as <coughs> the thing about metadata is that it might sound scary. It's just data about the data. It's data about the fields, the attributes, how you calculate them, and so on. But this is critical. And we are seeing a lot of data lakes that end up being uh, data swamps. And most of the times, it's because of, of not having a, a good metadata layer. So there are two main kinds uh, of metadata. There are additional ones, but the main two are obviously uh, technical metadata. Um, what we mean by technical is everything that's related to the technical side of the attributes or the fields, such as the format, the length, the naming, the different stages, the naming, the operational source system, <coughs> If they have a domain of values, what's the domain? Um, everything that's not business related. And obviously, the, the second kind of most common metadata is the functional metadata. Data. And here is if we have a field that is calculated, we will express how it's calculated. If we have a field that has a meaning, we will try to define the meaning of that attribute so that when everyone, anyone wants to search the metadata for some kinds of attributes or some kind of information, they will have the necessary data about what they need. And the technical metadata is generated at the raw layer. Once the data comes in, it should come in uh, with as much technical metadata as needed. Where is it coming from? What's the name in the source system? Where is it being stored? What's the name in whatever is being stored? And so on. The functional metadata is generated at the process layer. If I claim something that comes from the raw layer, I will say, OK, what's the definition of this attribute? Is it an amount? What kind of amount? Is it principal amount? Is it an interest amount? It's a default amount. And if it's calculated, of course, which attributes does it come from? How is it calculated? What's the, uh, the frequency of the calculus, and so on? There are more, more kinds of metadata, and you can add as many as you want. But probably the most common two, besides uh, technical and functional, are security metadata, which is very useful about, OK, who can access which attributes or which kind of data or which domain of data. For instance, if you have a, a multi-entity data lake, which entities can access everyone? 
And another one that's not so common, but it's very useful, is the reporting metadata. Usually in reporting, you're aggregating data. And aggregating, when you have financial data underneath it, is not as obvious. For instance, there are some fields that you need to just aggregate, the amounts generally. But for some other amounts, you need to do some, some calculated process in the, in the moment of aggregation. For instance, if you're aggregating the market data, you need to weight it by the duration. So having this kind of information can be quite useful. Now, as for the more fun layers, uh, we have external engines. This is very common in banking. And whether you have uh, an external engine for, for risks or for MIS or for whatever your needs are, they should be fed from, from a data lake. It, it really makes sense. You have cleansed data, you have the data in there, and even more, if you can return the data to the data lake, that's great. You will have everything in. And, and that's the goal in the end. If you're bringing in data from an external engine, it should always come from the raw layer. Basically, everything that comes from outside the data lake should always enter from the raw layer. So it can include third-party products, entire products, and as I was saying, it is fed from the process layer, and if it comes back, it comes back through the raw layer. Next one would be machine learning, and, and this is great. I mean, this is the, probably one of the most important points of big data in general. And big data is not about doing things faster or doing things with more data. It, it's mainly about solving paradigms that cannot be solved otherwise with traditional technologies. And here we're thinking about AI, and we're thinking about deep learning, or graph-oriented database, and so on. And again, it's fed from the process layer, and this is probably one of the few cases that it comes back to the process layer. Because in the end, the, the machine learning part is, is an integral part of the architecture. It's not like an outside information, it's not an outside source system. It's, it's a, a common part of the, of the whole architecture. Machine learning has a lot of applications within uh, financial institutions. Uh, we've done recently a uh, neural network system for credit scoring based on, on behavioral modeling, which is great. And it really can be useful and extremely useful if you have a data lake solution. <clears throat> now, we can add on top of that a speed layer. You can have real-time information within a data lake. It's not just for batch processing. Uh, you can have uh, a layer where you have real-time information. It should go through the raw layer and then move to the process layer and the reporting if needed. And you can do that in real time. I mean, moving through from layer to layer doesn't imply that it's a batch process, but you can do it on the fly. So as for the last layer that I'm adding to, the, uh, to this uh, common uh, architecture for data lakes, <coughs> is the uh, manual entries. There's a lot of information, whether it's for internal processes or for reporting or for many other needs, that does not exist in any source system, that cannot be derived from existing data, that you will need to input somehow. Okay, the only thing about manual entries is that they should always come from the raw layer. They should not go straight to the, to the process layer. Okay, let's move to, to technology. And I'll try to, to go uh, about some of the most, most inter uh, interesting uh, technologies for each of the layers. And, and please forgive me if I leave something out, because I will leave something out. There are a lot of choices, and there are a lot of ways to, to do this. But starting from the raw layer, uh, and I'm splitting this into two parts, uh, open source solutions, and private solutions, which I think are evolving great as well. So as for open source, it's, it's basically HDFS. I mean, that, that's the way to go. There are other uh, options, but they're not as used as, as or even close to, to HDFS. As for uh, private uh, technologies, um, we have, and we are comparing uh, Amazon and Google, yeah, just to be clear. Sorry for leaving out uh, Microsoft, but it, it's Microsoft. So, uh, as for Amazon, we have uh, S3, uh, which is great. Uh, for Google Cloud, uh, we, we have uh, Google Cloud Computing, so uh, those are basically the two options that you can go to. Now, for moving data between layers, and uh, this does not mean only from the raw layer to process layers, we will see, it can mean also from external sources to, to raw layers. Uh, within open source solution, uh, we have uh, HDFS, uh, again, with the map reduce, which is not as used as, as it used to when it came out. Now everyone's moving, well, everyone has already moved to, to Spark, uh, map reduce processes. You can also go with uh, alternative technologies, such as uh, Scoop, 
which is great from uh, moving data from relational databases to HDFS systems. And of course, if, if you want to move them on the fly in real time, uh, Flink's the way to go. Now, about private technologies, again, we have options within Amazon and within Google. Within Amazon, we have Glue. Uh, if you don't know about Glue, it's a technology that moves data, again, from relational databases to HDFS. The cool thing about it is that if you create a new attribute or a new table or uh, there's a change in the schema, it will import that part automatically. You don't need to configure it or uh, alter it if, if it changes in the source system. <coughs> we also have uh, EMR. Basically, EMR is a, a managed framework uh, for uh, big data uh, architectures, a managed uh, cluster. So you can build uh, beneath it uh, Spark or Hadoop or Flink. And uh, we have DMS as well from Amazon, which is uh, Database Migration Services. And again, for migrating from databases to, to HDFS, or S3 in their case. <coughs> now, for, for Google, you can create jobs within BigQuery if you want to go to a, a serverless solution. And about serverless solution, the thing is that there are a lot of technologies that are coming out that are not uh, server-based. The, you can rely on them without a, a server. They are usually more expensive depending on, on the amount of information that you need or, or how often you're accessing it. But you could be the whole data mart in a, in a serverless infrastructure. I won't go into detail because, I mean, it would be way a lot more time that I have. But yeah, you, you could build a, a, a solution based entirely on serverless architectures. And from Google, uh, you have Dataflow, and as I was saying, you can create uh, uh, jobs within, uh, within BigQuery to move data from one layer to another. Now, for the process layer, the process layer in the end is, is the same as the, as the raw layer. So we will have, again, HDFS, and we will have, again, H, uh, S3 and uh, Google Cloud Computing. The thing is that maybe you want to, to have the data if you go to HDFS in, in a different way maybe in a column-oriented way or a row-oriented way. In those cases, you have Avro and uh, Parquet, which are great options for uh, modeling data in different ways. And now for the reporting layer, um, as for open source, uh, you can go with Hive, you can go with Impala, you can go to a relational database. If you go to a relation da database, uh, relation database, relational database. Uh, we always try to go to uh, dimensional models based on uh, Kimball architectures. And, and Kimball architectures, even though they come from uh, old technologies and old architectures and traditional technologies, work great for, for reporting. And relational databases are, are quick, and the way to model them for reporting is in a dimensional way. So as for uh, private technologies, we then I have a, a BigQuery from, from Google, and uh, we have a Red Sea from Amazon. As you can see, there are some um, technologies that go straight to the process layer, and some technologies that are mainly uh, databases that lie in a physical separated layer. And about reporting is that besides uh, these technologies, um, you can add another kind of soft layer on top of it which would be the actual tool that, that you can use to access information. And in those terms, in about open source, you mainly have Pentaho. And you don't have that many options. Some new ones are coming out. Hopefully, they will do great. But, but in the end, you can go to solutions such as uh, Click or Tableau, which from our point of view are uh, way more powerful than open source ones or even any other competitors. Again, I'm leaving out uh, Microsoft. Perhaps not fairly, because they, they do have a good uh, reporting tools for this layer. Now, for machine learning, uh, open source, you probably all know that uh, you have, uh, again, uh, Hadoop and, and Spark with MLDIF and, and Mahong. And for private technologies, uh, now again, Google and Amazon. Um, you can go with, um, I forgot about, well, Google and Amazon. Sorry about it. <laughs> now, coming to the speed layer, um, I've just built one technology. 
and that's Flink. And it's probably the most important or the most representative uh, um, streaming in real time, real streaming uh, technology that there is right now. You could go through different approaches. You can go with Kafka and Spark. You go to a micro batches option. If you have a, a messaging broker within your organization, such as Rabbit or Tipco or whatever, you should really leverage on that. You can use that to get the information in, in the system in real time. There's no need to build a, a whole new infrastructure if you have something that already works and that is already delivering information. And, and well, from our initial three layers, we've come to a, a way more complex uh, architecture. And as I was saying, I mean, this is not the only way to, to go through a, a data lake architecture. There are many ways to approach it. And just keep in mind that about the technologies, there's not a right one. Uh, there's probably, I mean, it really depends on what you're going to do with it and your needs and the way you want to approach it. This is just an overview of, of the different ones. So for the next part, we're moving to methodologies. And I believe that data leaks and the, the best way to approach them uh, wouldn't exist without two things besides uh, big data in general, which is, of course, cloud computing. In general, big data wouldn't exist or wouldn't be as strong as it is today without cloud computing, whether it's an external public cloud or a, or a private one. And the second one is methodologies. And, and the thing is that they apply extremely great for, for, for big data, for, for data lakes. And agile methodologies really push the, the time to market premise that I was talking before. If you want to build a data lake, you need to be extremely fast in delivering data and getting data up and ready. And in the end, in the, end the only way to go is, is to go to, to an agile methodology. You, can, you cannot go to a, a whole waterfall and say, OK, I'm going to build a data lake. I will build it within three years. And OK, the first year, I will be defining what I want. The second year and a half, I will be developing what I have. And the last half of a year, I will be testing. And if we don't, it won't work. I mean, you shouldn't go that way. And it will, you will spend a lot of money and, and I mean, you should try to go to, uh, to agile methodologies. Now, the thing is that it's easy to speak about it, but uh, banks and agile methodologies are not yet, yet best friends. So it's really hard for, for a financial institution to, to go to an agile methodology. They need to have everything budgeted. They need to know what the times are. You cannot say, OK, I don't know how much it's going to cost, but I'm going to know it's going to cost less and it's going to be faster. And that, that won't make sense. So we found two approaches to go to agile methodologies within financial institutions that might help you out. The first one is that we've created our own agile methodology, which is based on micro waterfalls. And I won't go into much detail about our methodologies because, I mean, you probably don't want to, to hear me speak about that. But what I can tell you is that they are based on Larissa Moss's uh, methodologies. And they are, you can check them out in uh, William E. Moon's uh, Data Wars House 2.0 2 book, or it has some papers and so on. And as I was saying, it's really important to know where we come from in terms of business intelligence and know about traditional technologies and data warehouse and data marts and methodologies and so on. Because, I mean, there's a lot of, of useful stuff. And this is basically a methodology that is based on a quick definition, quick prototyping, and go as fast as you can to, to the testing phase and iterate. And the way we do it is we, we create micro waterfalls, which last between two or three months. I know two or three months is a lot of time compared to two or three weeks of a scrum methodology. But it's better to have two or three months deliverables than having a, a huge waterfall that lasts for two or three years. And the second approach, the approach that we found that uh, works well, well, this is the part that we iterate in if you want to check out the methodology within our uh, micro waterfalls. So the second part that we, or well, the second way that we've seen that uh, suits reasonably well uh, within financial institutions uh, in the way of approaching agile methodologies is okay, find those first reports or first business needs that you want to start your data lake with and just use a waterfall for an MVP. It won't be a big project. It should be something small. It's, it should start with something like a, a tracing bullet methodology, and I won't get into those kinds of methodologies, but they basically try to go from end to end of the architecture uh, with the single uh, most minimal 
part of information, but just to test that everything works and that uh, it's laid down correctly. But go to an MVP with a waterfall, set up a date, set up a budget, set up a time, and that will be easy for, for a financial institution to, to adopt instead of trying to go to, to an agile methodology straight away. But as soon as you have that, uh, move, for, move, to, move to Scrum for, for product evolution. And have your own Scrum team and, and go to agile methodologies for, for the continuous development. Now, next thing we have is uh, priorities within, within the bank. And we should really start with whatever is going to be used. I mean, don't start a data lake just for the sake of it, just for technology reasons. Just, I mean, find a user, find a, a business area that wants to have a data lake and start with them. It doesn't matter if it's big, if it's small. Just start with something that is going to be used by the user. And that's the most important part. If you do that, you will start building your layer years, you will start growing, and you will have something in place that is easy to grow instead of having a, a monster that no one is, is actually using. Once you have that, the second point is general agent information. And if you work in banking or in, in banking or any other financial institution, for any regulatory, uh, regulatory uh, report or requirement, you know that if data is not reconciled with the GO, it's useless. So if that first project that you had is not uh, GL related, try to get the GL as, as, as soon as possible. Once you have the GL, the next point that you need is management information, whether it's from uh, management information systems or for uh, asset and liability uh, management. In the end, the, the, the board of the bank uh, speaks in terms of profitability, revenue, and so on, about data that is not necessarily related with the GL as much. But that is management information. And you need to speak in those terms in any part of the bank, both terms, GL for regulation and management information for, for, for management, obviously. So the fourth thing would be to get personal information, uh, mainly for credit risk. Uh, credit risk is, is mostly based on, on the client's information rather than done in accounts or in balance information. So, so that should be the same priority. Of course, if you go through any of those in your first project, which you probably should, I mean, it's either related to, to any of those, uh, it, it will vary, but this is basically the, the priorities that we are seeing. And lastly, uh, go to non-core information. And that's marketing, that's CRM, that's whatever you want to, to do with the information that is not uh, directly uh, business related. You could start with that, but it's, it's not the way we, we recommend to go. I mean, if you start with a big data project for human resources, and I really love those kinds of projects, don't, don't get me wrong, but it won't be as effective as going to a business area that, that is actually uh, uh, trying to, to improve and use the, the data leak for balance and personal needs. Okay. And as for the last point, and I'm closing the presentation with this, I've tried to go a bit quicker due to the delays on the technical side. Hopefully we have some time for, for any questions that you may have. It's about taking advantage of the solution. Okay, let's say we have the, the data lake in place. And in place, I don't mean the, the perfect data, data lake that does not exist. The data lake is constantly evolving. And what's the best way to, to take advantage of it? And in the end, we have two sides. We have the business side, and we have the project team. And from the business side, uh, what we really recommend is to have a data scientist within the business area. They will be able to access the raw layer. They will be able to uh, go through all of the information that is in there. They will be able to create ad hoc reports. And if a new regulation comes out, they will be quick in order to deliver it. And once they, they have the information and they've sent it to the user, because I mean, then they are part of the user, and they're using the information, Having requirements for the project team will be extremely easy. I mean, it's just a matter of, OK, this is what I've created. I want this delivered on a monthly basis, or in a daily basis, or whatever. And now for the project team, this is a, a, a project that should be owned and sponsored from a, a C-level uh, uh, category, to say somehow. So there's already a figure for that, and a figure that has been a bit confusing or, or not well-defined, uh, at least since I've known it, which is the CDO, the Chief Data Officer. And they are doing things that no one really knows about data lineage and understanding the data of the entity and so on. No, I mean, their goal is to own this project. 
they should be the, pro the product owner for the Scrum team and the sponsor for the Scrum team. And that's the way you should go. They should, they should own this project and they should review this project and they should be accountable for the delivery of this project. And basically, I think going that way, data lakes are extremely good architecture for banking and you can really get a lot of it if you end up having a, a great data lake. And that's basically it. Hope, hopefully you've enjoyed it. I don't know if we have any, any questions from, from the audience. There's a, I don't know if we can get a microphone up there. Please don't be too hard on me. <laughs> Hi, hello. Uh, thank hello. you for your presentation. Thank you very much uh, for coming. Uh, I, I just would like to know how does it fit uh, non-structured data in your architecture because I haven't seen non-structured data within the whole architecture. Everything is columnar or not columnar had non-structural non and there is lots of data within national institution which are non-structured, see, like a contract, for example, which in some of the fields, they are not as structured as uh, we would like to be in a, in a data lake. Yeah, I mean, in, in the end, that's for the raw layer, uh, and while I was speaking about the process layer, about going to a columnar way or a uh, a raw way. For both the, the raw data and the process data, you can go however you want. I mean, if you want to go with a um, structure uh, modeling, you can go with that. It probably makes more sense to go with that in the raw layer and try to go with a more structured one in the process layer. But in, the really, in reality, those are the two layers where you can lay out information as, as you want. Uh, if, if you want to check out layers with the more technical guys than me, the way we are, are modeling each of the layers, we have a booth there, so feel free to come by and we'll get into more details. But yeah, in the end, about modeling each of the layers, it really doesn't matter, or you have the structure as you want, whether it's a structure or, or non-structured data. No, there's another question here in the front. Hello. Hello. I have two questions. Uh, um, uh, could you give a, a further explanation about what, uh, one of the reasons of failure is uh, you call something like focus on, uh, on irrigation? Can you explain? Sure, uh, sure. I'll, I'll, I'll develop on that. The thing about the irrigation process, it means uh, getting the data inside uh, the data lake, in the, in the raw data. And uh, from the entities we've uh, spoken with, some of them have tried to, to approach it as, OK, let's go to all of the source systems and get all of the data inside the, the data lake. There are some exception, exceptions where, where you could do that. I mean, if you are basing it on, uh, let's say, a Glue, for instance, from Amazon, and you can be extremely quick doing it, I mean, it could be all right. Uh, but for most of the cases, it's the wrong approach, mainly because it will take you a lot of time to get all of the data from all of your source systems. And keep in mind that whole source systems in banking are very heterogeneous and have a lot of information and, and really differ from one another. So it's, it's very hard to, to get the data from, from every, uh, everything. And you will spend a lot of time there. And the thing is that once you have the data, it, it will be very hard to understand what you have beneath it. Uh, because if you start with that without having any business requirement, uh, you won't know what to do with the data. And if, if once you have a business requirement, it will be very hard for you to, to get the data that you're actually looking for. So basically, it's, the second point is all right, but the first point and the main one is about the time to market. You should be as quick as possible to get to the reporting layer and have the data lake up and running and not spend so much time in other layers that don't really produce results. Okay, okay and the second question was, uh, you didn't spot any technology for the metadata. I guess you were talking about a schema. Yeah, I, I, I skipped that on purpose. And the thing is that we've really tried to, to find a, a good solution for metadata. And, and even for the presentation, we reviewed it just yesterday to see if there was something out that we were missing out. But the thing is that besides some technologies that have some kind of uh, good metadata solutions, for instance, Glue I was talking about has a kind of OK solution for technical metadata, we haven't found a single solution that, that is uh, uh, of good for global use of metadata. 
what we end up doing is doing uh, in-house projects and non-demand projects for creating a, a metadata database, and we have approached it in a very different ways, and you could do it with different technologies and so on. But in the end, all of uh, the projects that we've done have come out with, uh, with uh, self-developments de or with in-house developments for, for metadata. Okay, thank you. Oh, thank you. So I'm not seeing any hands. So thank you all for coming. Hope you, you, you've enjoyed it. Thank you.